let me talk about, if you've never heard of SIGGRAPH before, so first of all, this event is 50 years old, okay? And it's all about research, artists, developers, filmmakers. It's all about graphics and visualization, okay? Um, and, you know, think workstations on the hardware side and then think in the cloud doing workstation-like stuff up, up in the cloud. Now, the interesting thing about it is NVIDIA's biggest announcements had nothing to do with visualization uh, at all. Nope. So, you know, I, I scratched my head and I'm like, do I not understand uh, the product called the GH200, which is, you know, basically a, a super chip, which is a combination of, of Grace, which is a, by the way, GH means Grace Hopper. And Grace is the name of the CPU, and H is the name of the GPU. So it's a combo ARM CPU, but NVIDIA GPU. It's all about HPC and maybe about AI. Um, so it had nothing to do with that. So I, I think, again, I actually, I'll, I'll get to that at the very end and why I think uh, Jensen got up on stage there and talked about uh, this upgrade to the Grace Hopper 200, which essentially what it did is it added uh, memory and it gave higher performance memory on the GPU side. Interestingly enough, they pulled back the performance of the memory on the CPU. So uh, a couple interesting things there. I don't feel like NVIDIA is trying to pull a fast one. I think it was that they didn't need that memory performance on the CPU to get what they needed uh, overall for high performance computing and um, AI uh, training and inference. So uh, you might also ask the question, well, why a CPU? Like why not AMD or Intel as we see with like DGX? Well, interestingly enough, it's not about the performance of the CPU. It's all about the memory footprint, right? And I also think that NVIDIA can shave a tremendous amount of cost uh, using this ARM uh, Neoverse uh, as well. So um, the other thing it does is it it gives a more straightforward ability to connect the CPU to the GPU over NVLink. See, AMD and, and Intel um, are not the most motivated to put ports on the CPU to talk directly to NVLink. And they, they could also turn it off from generation to generation. So um, anyways, I just thought that was important stuff. So the new increased memory footprint, uh, it goes from 96 gigs to 141 gigs, and it's faster memory, and that's HBM3E. And Dan, you and I have done podcasts before on high bandwidth memory and what it means and what it doesn't mean, and this is the latest memory. The CPU memory, like I said, actually got slower which was interesting. Now the standard, the form factor for this goes in, which is an MGX, which is a single server, uh, which to me led me in the direction of why would NVIDIA bring this out? And the only thing I can come up with, which is bringing out an HPC and an AI chip at a visualization show is all about AMD and the MI300 and the value proposition that AMD came out with, right? Because AMD with the MI300 came out with this massive memory footprint. And um, let me explain why that memory is important. When you get into large language models specifically, and I also think there's a lot of other foundational models, you can keep that workload, whether you're training or inference, sitting in GPU memory that's really, really fast. In fact, with HBM 3E, the fastest memory that you can get uh, in that uh, in that memory, uh, sorry, in that form factor. So um, um, I think this is a competitive play. I don't know what they're expecting uh, AMD to come out with. Uh, you know, they came out with that big announcement about the MI300 and massive uh, memory footprint. And oh, by the way, them not needing to have two cards to hit that memory footprint. They only needed one. So I'm trying to figure out what that means, Daniel. Does this mean that uh, it's on between uh, AMD uh, and NVIDIA 
with large language models in 2024. Because by the way, this new system with HBM 3E comes out in Q2 2024, um, which is around the same time that the MI 300 uh, comes out. What do you think, Dan? What are your thoughts? I think it's, um, you know, they're running predictive uh, analytics and they're predicting the future. And, you know, right. if you're the company that makes the most sophisticated AI chips on the planet, I would say it's a high probability that you're probably running some 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 type of uh, data visualization that could understand the likely path in which AMD is going to take with its uh, with its MI series and where they're going to need to be competitive. I think, you know, NVIDIA has to look at how it can protect its moat right now and how it can give confidence. So if I was AMD right now, I'm out running around and saying, look what we're doing with memory. Look at how capable we're going to be. And of course, um, you know, there's a lot of debate right now because, you know, the, lo the logical way someone's going to tear this market apart and really create some disruption is going to be price. You know, NVIDIA has got this absolute foothold on the price and the margin. Yeah, we'll talk, we'll market. talk price a little later when we talk yeah. about Grok. Yeah. And, you know, nobody wants to obviously, you know, kill the golden goose here because you, you start getting, you know, you could, there's a bit of market fall off that I think is available on these, on these high end processors that um, is going to be had just because of availability, because of uh, the the ability to serve the customer, meaning NVIDIA has had so much growth so fast. I think AMD and even Intel is going to be able to compel some customers. Hey, come with us. We'll give you our focus and our attention. Spend with us. We're going to support the heck out of you, your specs. We're going to build around you. And I think they're looking at that. And like I said, so if I'm NVIDIA, what I'm saying is what are the most likely areas that we have some vulnerabilities? You know, you got companies like Intel and AMD that are historic CPU. We all know that for the biggest workloads, it is not just GPUs. It is GPUs plus CPUs. That's the training plus inference formula for the future. So you got all these kinds of things coming together. And it is basically saying, look, we've got the market. We've got the customers. They're tied in and hooked in to our software and our, our frameworks with CUDA. Um, let's make sure that they see the roadmap and they have no uh, real reason to want to consider changing. So I think that's what's happening. I think it's ambition on the front end. I think the company is going to continue to push the envelope and force the disruptors to have to be on their toes. If you want to disrupt NVIDIA, I think you got to do it. I think the easiest way to do it with, is with price. But we all know, because we know this from CPUs, we know this from laptops, we know this from many things in the business, it is a zero sum game. So you got to decide how quickly do you want to erode the profitability of the business. So I think the early hope is to keep... Uh, value high, keep margins high in the early stages because we know downward pressures will naturally occur over time. So great technical insights, Pat. Hopefully I added a little bit of flavor there in terms of what I think maybe uh, this all means for the business. 